Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Let, let us begin. Greetings to those of you who are with us in person today and to our friends who are with us remotely. We're grateful for that group of folks that watches Midweek Connections and connects with us uh, in that remote kind of capacity. Good day to, to be here. We wrap our season up today. Uh, Scott Raydell will bring a featured psalm to us today in a unique and creative way. So I'm not going to give you any more than that. Um, th that is not just a, a new necklace around his neck. That's there for a reason, and you'll, you'll figure that out here in a little bit. Uh, Andy's going to lead us forward, kind of settle us and guide us. As he's playing, this is a, a piece entitled Wonderful Peace, P-E-A-C-E, -E. uh, and it fits really well today. So uh, use this time to think about ways that God has brought peace to you, uh, ways that you can respond with acts of praise and thanksgiving, and then think about God's spirit. We're going to sing some about God's spirit today. So we've got a lot to ponder and to consider as Andy plays. Bless you for being here today. Thank you. Andy.
I was thinking during that time, our, our group may sometimes be smaller in number, but we are strong in ability and in talent and in commitment to share that to the glory of God and for the good of God's people, whether it be musical or spoken. Uh, so many of us have strengthened Midweek Connections throughout our recent seasons together. Thank you. Thank you. Bless you for who you are and for what you offer. Um, I want to invite you to a, a great hymn of praise. It's a Trinitarian hymn, Come Thou Almighty King. A stanza about God the Father, Christ the Son, Holy Spirit, and then we put it all together in stanza four. And if you'd be so kind and are able, let's stand as we sing. God's coming forward. That fits so beautifully with what Psalm 150 has to say. Come and share, Scott. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here, and thank you for allowing me to share my favorite psalm. My, my favorite psalm is Psalm 150, so if you have your Bibles and you'd like to turn with me, turn to Psalm 150. real easy to find in the Psalms. It's the last one. <laughs> Please follow along as I read. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expanse. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with stringed instruments and pipe. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, my first comment would be, what would you expect from a retired band director? <laughs> well, this would be my favorite psalm. But one thing I think about, too, is centuries ago, the scripture that was available was pretty much the first five books of the Bible and the psalms. 
And in Genesis 4, verse 21, it talks about a man named Jubal, who was the son of Ada in the line of Cain. And he was called the inventor of music of string instruments and pipe. And that's all is mentioned of him, just that one verse. So you sort of have music as a form of worship from the beginning of Scripture all the way to the known end at that time. Of course, many more books of the Bible have been added. And, of course, also I like that this uses just about all the instruments of that period of that known time. And, of course, many more instruments have been added. And I'd like to personally share... In 1970, I was 12 years old. In 1980, I was 22. And during the 70s, during the 70s, you saw a pretty big change in the form of music worship. You know, you had the addition of electronic instruments, electric instruments. And I'm so grateful for our church that we have many modes of worship and music. We have choir, of course, orchestra. We have the praise band. We have the jazz band. We have small groups of instrumentalists. We have small groups of singers. You know, I am so grateful that our church is open to this form of worship. And I have to uh, share with you, during those years, you know, there were times in certain churches that they wouldn't allow certain instruments to be played in the sanctuary you know there was some heated drama moments about that and 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 as far as far as the church goes I'm glad we're past that I'm glad we're way past that and I think about my high school and college years and I think about groups that were really uh instrumental in my music appreciation of worship I think of truth you may have heard these groups truth Dallas Home and Praise, The Imperials, Andre Crouch, you know, and on and on and on, Don Francisco, Phil Keggy, you know, all these people who reached out to youth at that time with, you know, electric instruments. You know, I think there may have been a swath of people who may not have come to the Lord and may have come in later years if it weren't for certain musicians who were, you know, offering up praise and worship. And another thing I like about this psalm is that it ends, it says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Now that's more than just humans, you know. That's all living things. All living things breathe. And so all living things are praising the Lord. They may be in ways that, We don't comprehend or understand, but they do praise the Lord. Now, I'm going to do uh, three music examples that I'd like to share with you. So um, I want you to be just a little bit patient because, one, I got a call off of YouTube. Now, I have listened to it, so I know that it's appropriate (laughs) for this, okay? Now, first of all, where uh, we talk about the ancient instruments and the string instruments and the lyre. You know, King David played, of course, as a young boy, played the lyre to soothe the nerves of Saul. Now, there are musicians who play those ancient instruments and actually sing tunes of the Psalms, and I'm going to play one for you. Let me get my volume up. It's short. This is a psalm in Hebrew. Then he'll do it in English. The translation works with it as well. English. 
okay, I wanted to play that as an example, that there are people who use ancient instruments today to show, you know, that could be an example of how King David soothed Saul's nerves. And now I'm going to give a demonstration that may seem a little comical, but I'll preface it with, all of you know Travis, right? The newest member of our family that was adopted into our family by Lauren and Josh. Well, one day we were at Travis's house, Lauren and Josh's house, and we were in his room, and we were just hanging out, visiting with him, and he did this. He was a little over one years old. He did this. When Travis was born, he, he had four drugs in his system, okay? And so, you know, of course, the doctors healed him, and the Lord healed him, too. But I also believe when Travis was in the womb of his birth mother that the Lord visited him, and he said, Travis, you're going to have a hard birth, but I want you to know I have a family for you. I have a church family for you already. So... It'll be a hard birth, but in two weeks, you'll have a home. And, and I believe Travis answered with just two words, yes, Lord. And then he was born, and here he is with us now. So, you know, I think Travis even pointed out to just me at that time how even the littlest ones can rejoice in the Lord. You know, it was just such a, you know, a living, loving moment in the spirit for me. Okay, and now I'd like to take my instrument here that I play in the church orchestra. This uh, this will be the bass clarinet, and I'd like to play a verse of my Jesus, I love thee. Now, normally bass instruments don't get to play the melody, but I thought this would be the perfect uh, room and time. The, the bass clarinet instrument has a really woody, warm sound. At least I hope to portray that today. So that's what I'm going for. So I hope you enjoy this uh, one verse performance of My Jesus, I Love Thee. The bass clarinet looks like a saxophone, but it's a member of the clarinet family. It's the bass instrument of that section, yes. A little old and creaky, but I didn't have a chance to warm up. <laughs> but anyway, thank you for letting me share my favorite song with you today and a little bit of what I feel behind it and some of the experiences I've had in this church being in this ministry. Thank you very much.
And I just want to say, that's in my key. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, I like that. Thank you so much. Hey, William. Yeah. I think Scott should play every Sunday, and I don't have to play piano then. <laughs> <laughs> Psalm, uh, Psalm 150 will always have added meaning for us, uh, the way you've described and shared. Thank you for that, Scott. You put so much into that. Uh, so shift gears just a little bit. Now we're going to think some today about God's Spirit. The birthday of the church and the outpouring of God's Spirit are celebrated 50 days after Easter. I bet you probably knew that. So this coming Sunday, we will celebrate Pentecost just by what it is. Um, today, let's, uh, we've already sung in verse 3 of our opening hymn. We've already sung about the Spirit Let's look at what's in your packet, the God, the Spirit, responsive reading. Let's read that, and then we're going to sing Spirit of the Living God together. We'll read this responsively. God, the Spirit, transforming presence. God's revelation, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. So our response, and we read all of this together. Holy Spirit, sweep through my being like a mighty wind. Fill and inspire me with the crackling fire of your presence. Heal and refresh me within the fold of your tender wings. Comfort and counsel me with wisdom and understanding. Breathe into me the breath and blessing of new and abundant life. read for us this morning from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I invite you to find it along with me. 2 Corinthians 3, as you turn there, uh, William, I, I happen to notice the, the tune name of that first hymn this morning, Come Thou Almighty King. Uh, the name of the tune is Italian Hymn. Uh, I don't know if it was deliberate or not, but that was a nice reminder of our mission team serving in Italy even now. Uh, at this moment, five, five of our church members there uh, doing ministry among refugees entering, uh, entering Italy, entering into Europe from North Africa and the Mediterranean. Uh, as we pray, following our scripture reading, we'll remember them. And uh, that, was a, that was a nice touch. Second Corinthians 3, beginning with verse 17. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. 
On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory, displayed in the face of Christ. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for an opportunity to gather together in the middle of the week and to, to contemplate your glory. God, as we have been reminded this morning, all creation, everything with breath, cries out to you. Uh, birds, the fish, the animals, the toddlers, the retired band directors, Lord. God, we thank you for each one of them. We thank you for the way they contribute their breath and their voice to your praise. God, we thank you as your people created in your image. We have the gift of, of words. We can yell hooray, we can clap our hands, but we can also bear witness to the gospel. We can speak of, of you, of what you have done for us and in us. God, we pray for our team now ministering in Milan. God, we ask that you would help them to proclaim your goodness by their words and by their deeds. God, I pray that as they work among refugees, seeking a home, seeking safe harbor, God, that they would extend hospitality and love, that they would do so in your spirit and in your name, Lord. God, we thank you for our friends that they are partnering with there who have dedicated their lives to this work. God, we pray that by going and spending a week or so with them, we would encourage and bless them and, and strengthen them for the days to come. God, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the opportunity to gather and worship. Lord, we pray for those who are hindered from being with us. God, those who are suffering illness, Lord, we ask for your healing touch. God, we pray for those who are grieving, Lord, particularly for the, the Carter family, the Brooks family. God, would you bring comfort and peace to them? God, we pray for the ministries of the summertime coming ahead as we as we wrap up midweek connections for the springtime, God, we think of the ministry that will happen in this room over the summertime with day camp and preschool and vacation Bible school. God, we pray that a winsome witness of the hope of the gospel would be proclaimed in those places. God, we pray that you would reveal yourself by your Holy Spirit to those children, to those volunteers and workers. God, we pray that all of us would know you in, in deeper fresher ways. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Josh, for the scripture and that prayer. Another reference about God's spirit that speaks to us, gives us guidance, is found in Galatians 5. And Matt Snowden is so great to quote this very often. This particular translation uses the word generosity rather than goodness, but let's, let's read it all together, all in unison. This is the fruit of the Spirit. Read with me. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. One of the songs that connects with that is where the Spirit of the Lord is. Let's stand and sing it together.
Thank you all for leading us today. A teacher's going to teach. Scott, you taught us well today, my friend. Thank you so much. Uh, I was very impressed that you could get down and up that quickly. Uh, you're, you're, you're likely the only person in the room that could do it quite like you did it. And uh, I'm not going to attempt it. Maybe Josh can. I don't know. Uh, but, man, I'm out on that one. That was, that was pretty great. <laughs> that, was, that was it. You were showing out there, my friend. Uh, it's all right. Pride cometh before the fall, though. So. <laughs> no, I think he's good. I think that's experience of playing on the floor. That is. You've been down there with Travis. You've been on that floor with Travis. I remember when, when you told that story, I just remember the, the brilliant Robert Cole said, all little children believe in God. All little children believe in God. And uh, that's, a, that's a pretty powerful insight from a very brilliant man. Uh, our text today is uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, and we'll read verses 12 to 14, 1 Peter chapter 5. We have come to the end of the run. So thank you for your patience as we've walked through this, this short little encouraging epistle. We have made it to the end and the final greetings and benediction. Uh, this is the part of the, of the text that people normally skip over to get to the next book in the Bible and they read through the Bible in a year plan. Uh, but there's, there's quite often some really rich theology in the final greetings and text, uh, as well as the salutations in the beginning. So let's start reading in verse 12. Through Silvanus, whom I consider a faithful brother, I have written this short letter to encourage you and to testify that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. Your sister church in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you. Who are in Christ. That was from the NRSV. Let's pray together. Our good and our holy God, we thank you that because of your goodness, your mercy, and your grace, we can uh, join with these in describing ourselves as being brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you, Lord, that this is our true identity, our destiny, and our hope. Uh, we thank you for a chance to worship in this place, to sing and to play and to praise, uh, Lord, to encourage each other and to study your word. Lord, by your Holy Spirit, would you reveal yourself to us in it as we offer ourselves to you living sacrifices. Lord, we love you. We love you because you loved us first. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen. This is our last gathering until uh, early fall. We'll ch stack this room up with kids for the next several weeks. So when the fall comes, this room will be delighted to see you again. Uh, <laughs> it will be good and abused in the name of the Lord over the next couple of, uh, couple of months. Uh, but we've come to the end uh, of, this, of this session and this season and this epistle. Uh, and some of you are going to start moving around a bit too. Uh, this is the time of the year people make trips, they, they go places, they do things. Any of you got any trips planned, maybe even short day trips someplace? Yeah, you're, you're going to go places and see people and do things. Uh, when you start to plan a trip, uh, there's really only a few ingredients, a few categories that you have to think about. You think about the people, you think about the places, and you think about the stuff you're going to do, right? So you, you, you have names and locations and itinerary, you have people, places, and practices, uh, who's involved, who's going with us, where are we going to go, and when we get there, what kinds of things are we going to do? Well, if you look at these final verses, this benediction, this, this uh, closing greeting, this final greeting, you really have to think of it in terms of people and places uh, and itinerary or practices or things to do. So when he writes, when Peter writes this church, uh, at the end, he emphasizes people. And he emphasizes some locations, and he emphasizes some practices. So there's, there's people, places, and practices, names, locations, and itinerary. And that's how I want us to think about it for a few moments as we close out this lesson on 1 Peter. Starting with people, people. If you go all the way back to the first chapter, the first verses in the first chapter, 
you have the, the, the people that he has addressed in this letter. And if you recall, or you might want to flip back, how does he describe them? He describes them as exiles of the dispersion, and then he names the places that they live in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. He says, okay, you're out there. Your life has been uh, stirred up. <laughs> everything's not settled. Everything's not fixed. Everything's not completely solid, but you're living. And you're living in, in concrete places, in real places, in the, in the Mediterranean basin. You're living in Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So, so you have that. You have this is how the people are named. They're named as the exiles of the dispersion. And, and he names himself. Uh, he says, is Peter writing to you from Peter? And then he gives the name of Silvanus or Silas. He says, through Silvanus. Now, there are three possibilities as to what the word through means. It could mean that Silvanus simply was the deliverer of the letter, the one who would come and, and offer it up and possibly give it some texture and explication like Phoebe with the book of Romans. She's a traveling business person and she's carrying within her cloak the scroll of the epistle of Romans, Paul's great magnum opus. And she's a leader in the church. And so she comes to town and she brings the text with her. And she, she, it's read in the, in the gathering and she gives explanation for some of the parts uh, for them to understand. So maybe it's just like Phoebe that she's going to deliver this text. Two other alternatives are that Silas or Silvanus serves as the secretary for Peter. That he gives out the core of the text, he lines it out, and, and Silvanus cleans it up. <laughs> this is one of the great reasons why people say, well, no, I mean, the criticism of this couldn't be Peter because the Greek's too good. Well, he's naming Silvanus here in chapter 5. A third possibility is even a broader view of this secretarial role. Uh, to where, you, you know, many of you have given over a letter to a friend or someone who's worked with you or for you and said, clean this up, and they've made you sound much better than you normally sound. But it's still essentially, uh, you're looking at your husband. I bet you've done that for him once or twice. Uh, and so, so you have that. Uh, and the third possibility is someone who has sort of um, deputized another to write in their name. Not an uncommon practice. We even do things like this today where it says, okay, here are the things I want to, to say to encourage these churches uh, in the Mediterranean basin, Sylvanus. Here's, the, here's my big ideas. Take it and run with it and do something with it. That would have been an appropriate practice. So it could have even been that. <laughs> Josh and I ran across a version of this uh, as we're finishing up our book project with Smith & Helmets. It's time for the blurbs, you know. And so we, we've asked several people to, to give endorsements for the book. And, and, and one person, we'll not, name the, we'll not name the person. This is a very uh, accomplished, very busy person. He said, we trust you guys. Love the project. Love the ideas. You've explained it to us. Don't have time to read every word. And uh, don't have time to write the blurb, but I want to blurb it. So here's what we do. You draft one for us. I'll, I'll say, yeah, that sounds great. Or I'll say, no, try again. And if it sounds great, we'll put it under my name. I say, okay, we'll give it a shot. We'll do it that way. And so, so possibly that's a version of what was going on. But Sylvanus was a player here. And it, it helps, to, helps us to understand why the Greek was so strong and so good. Uh, because Peter believes, as all Christians should, that Christianity is a team sport. <laughs> and God was working within a community of people to, to bless and encourage others. So there is Sylvanus. There's another name that shows up in here. What's the other name? If we're thinking about people, what's the other name? Mark. Mark. How does he describe Mark? It's my son. Uh, my son in the faith, someone I care deeply about. This Mark is John Mark uh, that we know from other places in the New Testament. What are some things we know about Mark? Uh, we know in Acts 12 something interesting about Mark. Basically, we know something about his mother. You have Peter delivered from prison in chapter 12. And when Peter gets out of jail in chapter 12, uh, we read this. 
As soon as he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was what? Mark. This is John Mark. Where they had gathered and were praying. When he knocked at the outer gate, a maid named Rhoda came to answer on recognizing Peter's voice. She was so overjoyed that instead of opening the gate, she ran in and announced that Peter was standing at the gate. This is one of the funniest scenes in the book, <laughs> book of Acts. <laughs> I mean, uh, Lord L. Harris used to sing a song about Rhoda, open the door, don't turn and walk away. And uh, so here, here's Peter showing up, and here's this servant coming to the door. Oh, it's Peter, great! She leaves him right there out in the dark, and she goes and tells him, hey, Peter's out there. Uh, I just think it's one of the fantastic scenes. But where does Peter go? He goes to the house of Mary, who was the mother of John Mark, because this is the place that had become the headquarters of the, of the early church, the young infant church. Peter knew where to go when he got out. He knew where his people were going to be. They were going to be at Mary, the mother of John Mark's house. So very likely she was a, a person of means. She had a home that was large enough to accommodate uh, a gathering of folk. Uh, and that's where they were. So, so John Mark, who is also described in Colossians 4.10 as Barnabas' cousin, was part of an early influential family in the Jesus movement. You know that Paul and Barnabas had a falling out over John Mark at one point because Paul and Barnabas took him on a trip, an early trip. Uh, something happened. He returned uh, and then uh, Barnabas wanted to go on another trip with John Mark. Paul said, no, it's not going to happen. And Barnabas, being the ever-encourager, saw the hope that was in this young man, stuck up for him, him being a, a family member. And so they, they parted ways for a season. But toward the end of Mark's life, uh, there's evidence in uh, Philemon and in 2 Timothy that there was a reconciliation with Paul, and Paul viewed him as very useful for the cause of Christ. Church tradition says uh, that Mark is the one who wrote the first gospel that we have, the gospel of Mark, that he would wind up taking, uh, taking the gospel into parts of Africa, that he was martyred in Alexandria, that he was a significant leader in, on that continent. Today, the symbol of Ethiopia is the lion, which was the symbol of Mark, St. Mark. Uh, for, for many, many generations, for thousands of years, African Christians had viewed Mark as the, as the founding pillar of Christianity on that continent. Early, early, early witness to the gospel. Uh, so here, here's this scene. There are these frustrated Christians in, in the Mediterranean basin. And Peter is there with Mark, son in the faith whose family has some means and they've, and they've put all their chips across the table and they've, and they've aligned themselves with Christ and, and his mother's home was the center of the early church and, and here's this young guy with a whole life ahead of him but who's put all his chips across the table too and, and they're facing stressors and disappointments because of their commitment to Jesus and they said, we gotta, we gotta write to them. Oh, it doesn't have to be long. We need a message sent out to him. Where's Sylvanus? Where are you, buddy? Help us out with this one. We got to get a letter to these people in these cities in the Mediterranean basin because we want to encourage them. We want to strengthen them. We want to invite them to stand in the grace that we know to be true in Christ. We, we want them to bask in the hope that they have because of the resurrection. Hey, let's, let's get together on this. The names are listed to remind us that this isn't some, some felt board lesson disconnected from real life, but that it was born in concrete circumstances uh, and it moves down through the ages of time into concrete circumstances and that it's rich and meaningful and full of life and full of courage. So you have the people. You have the people of the dispersion. You have Peter. You have Sylvanus. You have Mark. And then you have the places. You have the churches of the Mediterranean basin. You have Babylon. There's, there's a couple of possibilities as to what Babylon is. Uh, what is that place? The prevailing notion is that Babylon is Rome, that he's writing from Rome. This is code for Rome. And, and most people who think about these things think this is what it is. 
Uh, there's a minority opinion that has some real weight behind it. Um, Tom Oden is one who says this, is that no, prob probably not Rome, but very possibly Babylon of Cairo. You'll, you'll find places where they, where they really affirm this, that maybe he's writing from Cairo. If there's a background relationship with Mark and his family as they're uh, coming out of Cyrene and, and relocating into Jerusalem, and you're in trouble and you got to get out of town for a while, you gotta, you got to lay low for a minute in order to get back in the game, Cairo has always been a possibility for Jewish people. Where did Jesus and the Holy Family go when he was a little baby about Travis's clapping age? I mean, Jesus did his clapping in Africa to the good Holy Lord. So there's a, there is a chance, and we don't know this for certain. We probably won't know this for certain, but there's a straight-faced, honest chance that Peter and Mark are positioned in Cairo, and they're writing to these churches in the Mediterranean basin. That does a lot in my mind. That just opens up some doors. It's a fascinating notion. But they're in real places. Either, either the great city of Rome or the great city of Cairo. But they're there because of their love of Christ. Sort of displaced but still functioning as faithful followers of Jesus. I mean, they weren't planning these things, but that's how life got there. You ever gotten to a place you weren't planning to go? I mean, Yeah. Every single living last one of us as part of being human. And I'm, I'm sure when Peter was out fishing, he didn't think, well, one day I may wind up in Africa writing to a bunch of people in Turkey about Jesus. But that's what happened. From the get-go, the movement of Christ was a global movement. So he says, you're there, I'm here, but there is a third category. There is a third place, if you will. He said, we are in Christ. Your sister church in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends greetings as unmarked. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. The scriptures describe the church as being located in two places all the time. Places like Corinth. You are in Corinth, but you're in Christ. You're in Bithynia, but you're in Christ. You're in Babylon, but you're in Christ. You have a dual identity. We dwell in the world, but we're not of the world. Uh, and that's a powerful truth. And he says, look, we're in different places, but we're together. You're over there, we're over here, but we're together. Because together we're in Christ. And this is what really fires us. And this is what encourages us. And this is what motivates us and animates us. All throughout this book, there's been sort of a vision of place and time that is beyond those things that you can touch and smell and hear and taste. There's a deeper dimension to reality than just what we can experience sensually. There's a linear understanding of time, but there's also this sort of bizarre, uh, horror, you know, vertical kind of axis you got going on too. Not, not only are we moving forward, but the future is crashing into the present from a Christian perspective. And that we are experiencing and being confronted through God's word with the cross and the resurrection over and over and over again as God breathes new life because he is the one who raises the dead. So if Jesus be raised and if Christ is coming, there's a whole different view of where we are positioned in the universe. We're right where we are, but here's the wacky thing, and this is consistent throughout the New Testament. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. We're in McLennan County, but we are in Christ. So place for a Christian takes on a rich and powerful dimension. Were we not seated with Christ in heavenly places was the testimony of the old Pentecostal as she walked out of a worship service to her friends. Were we not seated with Christ in heavenly places? When we come together in the name of Christ, 
when we, when we recognize our nearness to him, even if we are divorced by geography, then we recognize a level of life where we could say we are together seated with Christ. Whether we be in Cairo or Bithynia or McGregor. People, places, and practices. Names, locations, and itinerary. If all these things are true, what were they to do? Well, one, they were to be encouraged by the word. He said, I wrote you this brief letter to encourage you. There's a great and rich encouragement that comes as we, as we marinate our lives in the scriptures, in the Holy Scripture. One of my favorite texts of scripture, and one I've been invited to preach at New Hope Baptist Church up the hill next month, is from Romans chapter 15. Romans 15 verse 4 says, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. See, Peter and Silvanus were partnered together in the production under the hand of the Spirit of the Scriptures. Written in olden times, yes, but everything written in olden times was for us. Just like the Old Testament was for the Romans. That we with steadfastness might have hope. Any theology of Scripture that doesn't include a heavy dose of the purpose of Scripture to encourage the people of God. Uh, is one that needs to be called into question. But that's what they got. They got a letter. They got words. And these words had them behind them the word. And these words were encouraged them and strengthened them to live in those days. And then the very end, he put the cookies on the lowest possible shelf. He said, I wrote to you about the grace of God. Stand fast in it. We would say today, hang in there. Keep on keeping on. Stay with it. Don't quit. Stand strong. Stand fast. And the witness of history is that they did. That for 260 years, Christians in places like Pontus and Bithynia stood fast and kept the faith. This is a remarkable thing. Uh, If you go back and look at the history of things, if you assume that the book was written in AD 63, there was no formal persecution of the Christians in that region until AD 112. That's almost 50 years. So at the beginning of these troubles, they were facing the social troubles of being rejected by former friends and neighbors and coworkers. They were facing the stigma of it. They were losing some money. They were being pressured. They were being harassed. And in the midst of that, you were tempted to say, well, oh, the sky is falling, and chicken little becomes your cry. The sky is falling when it's just an acorn on your head. They could have quit. <laughs> they could have they posted up in the hills and waited for the return of Christ, becoming absolutely useless in the world. That was the temptation and that was the fear when the pressure came. So Peter wrote them a little letter. And he said, stand fast. And for 50 years, it wasn't an official persecution, but it, it would come. Uh, the movement in Pontus and Bithynia made significant inroads for four decades. Uh, by AD 112, Trajan sent Pliny the Younger as the governor of the province of Bithynia to check it all out. And he was an absolute, complete bureaucrat. And he started to pop the hood on the Christians and ask all kind of questions. And he wrote back, and this is what he said. He said, therefore, I deferred further inquiry in order to apply to you for a ruling. I mean, I've looked into this thing, and now I'm going to stop for a while, and I need to know what to do. Because he was the middleman. He wasn't going to take responsibility for any of the action. He said, this case seemed to me to be a proper one for consultation, particularly because of the number of those who are accused, accused of what? Accused of being a Christian. My pastor, when I was a kid, used to say, if you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? (laughs) He said it all the time. Well, they were looking for evidence in these people's lives. They were looking for fruit. 
I mean, this was literally going on. And he said, hey, there's plenty of people who are accused and there's plenty of evidence that they're guilty of being followers of the way. He says, nor has this contagious superstitious spread through the cities only, but also through the villages and the countrysides. But I think it can be checked and put right. So for decades, the contagious superstition that was the way of Jesus was spreading from the cities into the countries, from men and women and boys and girls. And Trajan wrote back to Pliny, and he said basically this. He instituted what would be an equivalent of a don't ask, don't tell policy. He said, don't, don't enter into any real hardcore destruction of these persons, he said, but make life difficult for them. Try to discourage it, but don't go overboard. And so sort of a normal life returned, and that normal life was a life of being marginalized but not martyred, of being harassed but not killed. It would be costly to be a Christian but not fatal. So they soldiered on. And with an odd exception here and there, this is how they operated for the better part of 200 years. Say that with me, 200 years. So the strategy of First Peter would be a strategy that would nourish the church for two centuries. The next big outbreak that would come came in A.D. 323, when the Roman emperor came hot and fast at the church Licinius was the leader, and he sought to, to crush the church in that region, largely because they had grown so much and become such a vital part of the communities. At that time, the edict went out that Roman governors were free to punish innocent Christians, shut down some churches, demolish others, and in the case of bishops in Bithynia Pontus, south of the Black Sea, murder key figureheads of the clergy, According to Eusebius, their bodies were cut up and thrown into the sea to feed the fish. This ended in 324 because that emperor lost a civil war to a little guy named Constantine. <laughs> and the whole history of the thing pitched. But for 261 years, 261 years, the message of that little epistle nourished the Christians in that little area, and they stood fast. They didn't quit. They didn't give up because they were there, but they were also in Christ. And that message is a message for all of us that are here, but also in Christ. This week I had a long conversation with a friend who is a BSM director at a university in Louisiana. His name is Bill. And he said, what are, you, what are you teaching through right now? I said, I'm about to finish up a Bible study on First Peter. I said, I told him I was doing it in the morning time. I told him about this Bible study. He said, I teach First Peter to our college students every year. He said, because I have not found a better encouragement for young kids trying to live a faithful Christian life on a university campus in the United States of America. I thought, all right, that'll work. <laughs> and it does because it's worked for thousands of years. People, places, things. It really all does boil down to those things. <laughs> Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much that you've called us to the strenuous, hopeful life of the gospel. Lord, empower us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Empower us to love each other in your name and for your glory. Empower us to be true to your call. We love you and we thank you for loving us. Bless our time together around the table. Bless it in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. What a thorough study. We may need you to do this again next time. <laughs> go, go, yeah, yeah, there's, a, there's other letters, other ways. Um, I want to take just this moment with, with you here to uh, offer a word of thanks and gratitude to our staff who have helped 
Midweek Connections, our pastor, Matt Snowden, you know this guy. Uh, Josh Hayes has been here almost every week. Uh, Andy Muskrat has been here almost every week. Fortunately, when Andy has to be gone, we have a number of folks that have been able to fill in. But as you were led, express your appreciation to, to this wonderful team. Um, we're, we're blessed to have this kind of um, interest and leadership right here in our midst during our midweek connections. Thank you, colleagues, very much. Uh, and along with that, thanks to all of you who have been willing to share uh, as this, the semesters have gone by. We've had favorite kind of scriptures. We've had psalms to consider. We've had so many things that have created connection points for us. And I hear you talking about them sometimes at lunch or just being aware of some of the things that we've shared. That's, that's really been valuable. I think it's kind of fitting, Scott, that you're wrapping us up. Man, we've got a visual image now of uh, good and aural as well of, of good things that you brought us today uh, let me just highlight and josh has already mentioned our mission team in italy with uh, uh Ogburns, and let's continue to pray for them that's going to be very important uh, as they continue their work there i want you to know that um as Caitlin left, and she's one of the folks on that mission team, she asked me if I would once again make an invitation for you to consider helping with Vacation Bible School. This is a list of seven ways you can help, and there's seven really simple and, and fairly easy ways. I have some of these copies, and if you are going to help, I'll just need you to fill out a form. I have these forms. But she left with a little bit of, uh, well, I hope things come together because she comes right back and we go into Vacation Bible School June the 5th through the 9th. So if you haven't signed up, there's something that you can do. We'd be, we'd be delighted and blessed by your presence in that. Um, Scott yeah, Scott, sure. Uh, I've been volunteering Vacation Bible School, and I just want to make it known, you know, you have children that come to Vacation Bible School, and it's who do not regularly come to our church. Right. Yeah, that's right. You, you walked with them. Well, then that's, that's important to get them transported, to get them moved from one place to the other. Yeah, that's good. You're a good leader like that. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Other places we can continue to serve through the summer, Gospel Cafe. Uh, would be blessed by any food items that you might be able to bring. You know that list, especially hot dogs, hot dog buns, and potato chips. Bring them to the main office. Give me a call. I'll meet you somewhere and get them from you. Um, and and sometime along the summer, if, if you're able and interested, talk with Doris Hamrick about maybe coming on a Wednesday or Thursday or Friday and helping to serve folks and clean up a little bit at Gospel Cafe. That would be, that would be great. Um, we will restart after Labor Day. We'll let you all know about that, and you can kind of help spread the word. Andy asked me if I would share with the group that his little son, Jamie, the youngest boy, broke his clavicle playing soccer. And Andy just said he's in, in a bit of pain and trying to, you know, it's hard to get a clavicle back together again, but it is possible. So remember Jamie Muskrat in that regard. Um, Nancy McKinney has a procedure on May 31st. You'll want to be prayerful about that. And Lindsay sent me a text asking for prayer. She's had kind of a viral infection that's really been hard. Uh, it's affected her sinuses, her throat, but it's also moved into her muscles, and she's having a difficult time with arm and hand movement. So Anne, really appreciate your your concern in that. Two good things, and we'll kind of close out with this. Today is Barbara Tandy's birthday, and yes, we will sing to her at lunch today. So get your voice ready to sing happy birthday to Barbara. And then I have back on the table there a little card, just something for your wallet or purse, that has Tammy Nowlin's address on one side and Debbie Potter's address on the other, the two ladies that um, are our food service people on Wednesday for Midweek Connections. And just on your own, 
would you please send them a card, write them a note, send them a text. Um, they would really be blessed by just hearing from us. And of course, we'll do that today. And she has salmon patties ready for us today. Who, who volunteered her to do that? Are you here with us today? Somebody requested salmon patties. That would be Nathan got it done for us today. Bless you all. I'm going to be available to you as the summer proceeds, so feel free to text or call. Um, keep me posted in what's happening in your life and in the lives of those around you. And let's look forward to coming back together again and, and growing again stronger. That's it. Let's go eat together. Blessings. <laughs>